Well, thank you. It is for me a great pleasure to be with so many wonderful people. And I first want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak with you about an enterprise that I am passionately committed to, not only through my research and my writing and my advocacy, but as a mother and grandmother, deeply concerned, as so many of us are, about what kind of future our children will inherit. And this is the ever more urgently needed enterprise of fundamentally changing our economic direction, starting with new measures of economics, because we are not measuring the right things. Did you know that a natural disaster, war, imprisonment, will all end up as showing as economic growth in our gross domestic product, or GDP. Did you know that this measure, GDP, which, of course, our economists, our policymakers rely on, does not measure human well-being, does not measure environmental sustainability, does not measure even long-term economic success. And did you know that this wealthy United States now has the highest infant mortality rates, the highest maternal mortality rates, and the highest child poverty rates of any developed nation? And of course, that does not show up in GDP. So, we obviously cannot keep relying on these limited and distorted measures if we're going to meet the unprecedented social, economic, environmental challenges that we face. We need to really have some fundamental change. So, in the short time that I have with you today, I am going to invite you to join me in four actions. Four actions that every one of us can take, that every one of you can take, to really move us to new ways of thinking about economics and structuring economics. The first, changing the conversation about economics. Einstein said it, you cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we really need something different. We need economic systems that recognize something that once articulated may sound perfectly self-evident, which is that the real wealth of our nation, the real wealth of the world, is not financial. And we certainly saw that, didn't we? With the meltdown of all of those derivatives, all of those credit swaps into thin air, right? The real wealth of our nation, of the world, consists of the contributions of people and of nature. So we need what we have not had, economic systems that give visibility and real value to the most essential human work, the work of caring for people and caring for our Mother Earth. Now, just putting caring and economics in the same sentence, a lot of people do a double take, don't they? We're just not used to that. But think about it. Isn't that a terrible comment on the distorted values we have learned to accept as driving our economic systems? So we really 
There are many reasons that we've accepted this, but one of the reasons is what I mentioned. The economic indicators that obscure reality, that don't really show these distorted values or the tremendous suffering, the environmental damage, the hunger, the poverty that result from them. And that takes us to our second action, changing the economic indicators. You know, if you really look at GDP, it is crazy. Our gross domestic product, and you know, we see it everywhere, don't we? I mean, that's the thing that's trotted out. Did you know that it actually includes, as quote, productive work, activities that harm and even take life? Making cigarettes, for example, the medical bills, the funeral costs, they're great for GDP. They're all in there. Natural disasters, oil spills, hey, the cleanup costs, the lawsuit, all of the, you know, depositions, expert witnesses, all go into GDP. But not only do these measures fail to put negatives in as negatives, in fact, they put in negatives as positives, but they do not include the work as productive that contributes the most to human well-being. And by this, I mean the life-sustaining activities of three sectors, three economic sectors, that we have to start taking into account. The household economy, the natural economy, and the volunteer community economy. We need, my friends, a full-spectrum economic map, and then we can have measures that accurately reflect reality. Now, immediately, somebody's going to come up to you and say, yeah, but you cannot really quantify the value of this work. Well, not only can you, but it's already being done. I'll give you one example. I always like to use Switzerland, because it's not exactly the most radical nation in the world. Well, the Swiss satellite report on the value of household work, and most of that work is caring work. It showed that if it were included in the reported Swiss GDP, it would constitute a whopping 70% of the reported GDP. Other satellite reports price it, depending on the method they use for computing the value, anywhere between 30 and 60 percent. No, that is huge. But, and this is very, very serious, even most of the new economic measures now being developed, and I'm sure you've read about some of them, as either supplements or alternatives to GDP, fail to include the value of this essential work. And this is why I'm working with a team to develop a whole new set of indicators, social wealth indicators. And these indicators will, among other things, do three major things. First, they will demonstrate the enormous return on investment, business investment, government investment, in caring for people and nature. Second, they will have much more information on something that, well, on marginalized populations based on race, religion, on children, on women. We may be the majority, but we are marginalized, aren't we? Uh, so the third thing, and this may come as a surprise to some of you, it will, these measures, these social wealth measures, will show the powerful predictive value of the status of women and the closely related status of children for both quality of life and long-term economic success. And that takes me to the third action, showing the gender connection. And yeah, that there's a connection between economics and the status of women 
Uh, we'll take some people aback again, because after all, we're so used to being told that anything connected with the female half of humanity, that's just a women's issue, right? Well, I can quickly give you empirical evidence of this connection. A research study at the Center for Partnership Studies compared statistical measures from 89 nations on the status of women with measures of quality of life, such as infant mortality, such as human rights ratings, environmental ratings, and found that the status of women can be a much better predictor of general quality of life and long-term economic success than GDP. <laughs> now, since then, there have been other studies, the World Values Surveys, the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Reports. And yet, and yet, neither economists nor policymakers are taking these studies into account. And it's up to us, up to you, to see that they do. For one thing, my friends, there is no way that we can realistically solve the seemingly intractable problem of poverty and hunger without taking into account what we know, that the mass of the poor and the poorest of the poor worldwide are women and children. And that's not only because of discriminatory laws, discriminatory customs, it is also because the caring work, yeah, at home, in families, that women worldwide still primarily do is by most nations, you'll see that there are some that do, but most nations fail to support this work. But there's much more. Along with the subordination of women, of the female half of humanity, that we've been trying to leave behind, has come a gendered system of values. Think about it. This is a system that we, is so entrenched that we're not even aware of it. That anything stereotypically associated with women or, quote, femininity is devalued. And it's devalued whether it's done by a woman, you know, like caring, caregiving, or a man. And it's devalued whether it's in business or social policy. So, we have to become aware of this. We have to become aware of the, if you will, the hidden mass of the iceberg. And this is really a huge hidden mass of the iceberg. And of course, my friends, we're not talking about anything inherent in women or men. I mean, look at all the men who are today doing fathering, right? the way once considered exclusively appropriate for women, for mothering, not for, quote, real men. You know, that was not something that real men would do, to do this hands-on, diapering, feeding, right? And of course, men get so much pleasure from it, because both women and men, by the grace of evolution, get endorphins, as you know, not only when we are cared for, but when we care for another whether it's for a child, a friend, even a pet, right? So, as we look at this, we see something very interesting. We see, however, that it's only as the status of women rises that men no longer find it such a threat to their status, to their so-called masculinity, to also embrace these more stereotypically feminine caring, caregiving priorities and activities. Which takes me to the fourth action, because my friends, it's only as this really happens on a large scale that we begin to move to a caring economics. And with this, we see, as I said, an enormous return on investment. 
And so this takes me to the fourth action. And I'm counting on you to go out there and do this, because we have to lay these foundations. And the fourth action is very simple. It is publicizing, making known the enormous return on investment in caring for people starting in early childhood and caring for our Mother Earth. And we see this dramatically in the nations that according to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap return, re reports have the smallest gender gap. Nations such as Sweden, Finland, Norway, where, yes, there is much more equal partnership between women and men in both the family and the state, so much so that women are 40% of the national legislatures. Now, these nations, which sometimes, not coincidentally, call themselves caring societies, they have government-subsidized stipends for families to care for children. They have government-subsidized high-quality child care. They have, of course, universal health care. They have very generous paid parental leave. They have government subsidies for solar power. They have, even as in Norway, social security credit for the first seven years of caring for a child at home. Now, these are economic inventions, because that's what economics is. It's human invented, right? That we can all have. Now, what these nations really did, of course, is they made it a top priority, right? To invest in their human infrastructure and in their natural infrastructure. And those are very important and very much ignored these days. And we can't afford to do that. Now, of course, they pay very high taxes, but think of what they get for them. You know, we shell out money like crazy for all these things, don't we? Well, not only are these kinds of caring policies beneficial to individuals, to families, but they are extremely beneficial to a nation's long-term economic success. You know, these nations, Sweden, Finland, Norway, at the beginning of the 20th century, they were so poor that there were famines. Some of you may remember whole states, Minnesota, got published by people fleeing, right? Because they invested, as I said, in caring for people and nature in their human, and natural infrastructure. Today, they have very low poverty rates, a generally high standard of living for all, and you know that they are always in the top ranks, not only of the United Nations Human Development Reports, but of the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Reports. So caring pays, but when you look at this, you see something very sad and something that we have to do something about. Because what this shows is that this gendered system of values is unfortunately still very strong in many world regions. And you see that writ large, don't you, in the politicians who always have money for the, quote, stereotypically masculine, wars, weapons, right? But somehow, they can't seem to find money for child care, for nutrition programs for children, for education for children. Well, that is absolutely counterproductive. Because consider, and today, of course, they're talking about cutting uh, these programs even more, when in fact we have to invest m much more in them. Because consider that as we move into the post-industrial knowledge information era, it is suicidal, economically suicidal, to not invest in human capacity development.
You know, even mainstream economists never tire of telling us that the most important capital for the post-industrial knowledge service era, it is high, they like to call it high quality human capital, flexible, creative, innovative people who don't just know how to take or give orders, who can work in teams. Well, <laughs> we know from neuroscience today, not just psychology, but from neuroscience, that whether or not these capacities are developed heavily hinges on the quality of care children receive on their education, yes, on everything that's today on the chopping block. Now, let's go back to these four points. Change the conversation about economics, start talking about caring economics. Change the economic indicators. You know, if we don't measure the right things, if we don't make, look, what's not visible is not counted. And that's why I am so committed to developing these social wealth indicators and the approach that we're taking is the approach that shows the return on investment, on government and business investment, how high it is, not only in human and environmental terms, but in purely financial terms, as I've just briefly illustrated for you. And there are many, many more studies. Now look, there's much more I'd like to share with you, but I really want to close with a call to action. Economic systems are human creations. We can, and today we must change them. So when you go home, start talking about caring economics, not only with your friends and your family and your colleagues, but with your policymakers, with your thought leaders, with the media. Uh, form study and action groups and use what you learn. Apply it to your own life, to your own business, to your own community, and yes, to our nation. Uh, demand, demand social wealth indicators so that we can put our money into what really makes a difference. As I said, caring for people starting in early childhood and caring for nature. Uh, I'm asking you to join me in becoming impassioned and committed agents for a fundamental social and economic transformation so that we may move to a caring economics and with this to a more caring world. Together, <laughs> together we can do this. As I said, economic systems are human creations. So let's do it. Let's do it for ourselves. Let's do it for ourselves, let's do it for our children, let's do it for generations to come. I thank you. <laughs>